<laughs> Music stopped a little early, and I'm already wearing this for the service. <laughs> you guys get to be famous today. The recording on Sunday didn't work. When the technician was in here fiddling around trying to fix some things, he made a change, which made the now our recording start automatically. All you have to do is have it powered up, and it'll stream the service whether someone's there or not. But it didn't start up because he had made a change. <laughs> Broken. So we have folks joining us today uh, behind you, behind Les. Um, just don't bump the camera. Um, but I always, uh, I always welcome the folks who join us online and, uh, and by phone. Um, you folks are getting the service a little late. It'll be out now on Wednesday afternoon. Um, these neat folks in here meet every Wednesday. We repeat Sunday service at 1030 on Wednesday. And if you think coming to the big service is intimidating, come in and meet these folks because most of them are really nice people. <laughs> they're all they're all wonderful, wonderful people. Yeah. Um, and we always we usually have some chairs. I keep kidding that uh, the Wednesday crowd, the Sunday crowd, better get to work because the Wednesday crowd's already setting up chairs. So, so. But um, anyway, we're gonna go through the service here, and we are heading into the third miracle of Jesus that we're looking at. We're looking at these three miracles of Jesus and seeing what we can learn from them. Uh, this time we're going to look at Jesus um, calling the storm, right? Yes, we are. And, um, and, and it's, it's interesting. I want you to remember this. They're in the storm because Jesus sent them there. It's his fault, right? So as we go through this, understand he, he did this on purpose, Right, so so we're gonna look at that. Um, we are gonna get then kick things off by singing our first hymn uh, as soon as this comes back. Come on, there we go. And uh, let's see, it's gonna be uh, number eight six nine, verses one three and five. <laughs> We make our beginning in the name of our God, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, 
Have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. So as a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority I do therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. May the Lord who has begun this good work in us bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace be with you. you. Our intro it begins, They cried to the Lord in their trouble. He made the storm be still. And the waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad that the waters were quiet. And he brought them to their desired let, let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love. For his wondrous works to the children of man. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. They cried to the Lord in their trouble. And he delivered them from their distress. We sing, Lord, have mercy. The Lord be with you. And also with you. We pray. Merciful Father, your patience and loving kindness toward us has no end. Grant that by your Holy Spirit we may always think and do those things that are pleasing in your sight through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please. The Old Testament reading from Joshua chapter 5 reminds us to be open to divine guidance in the face of new challenges. As soon as all the kings of the Amorites were beyond the Jordan to the west, and all the kings of the Canaanites, who were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan to the people of Israel until they had crossed over, their hearts melted, and there was no longer any spirit in them because of the people of Israel. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, Make flint knives and circumcise the sons of Israel the second time. So Joshua made first night flint knives and circumcised the sons of Israel at Gebia Haralah. And this is the reason why Joshua circumcised them. All of the males of the people who came out of Egypt, all of the men of war, had died in the wilderness on the way after they had come out of Egypt. So all of the people who came out had been circumcised, 
have all of the people who were born on the way in the wilderness after they had come out of Egypt have not been circumcised. For the people of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness until all the nation, the men of war who came out of Egypt, perished because they did not obey the voice of the Lord. The Lord swore to them that he would not let them see the land that the Lord had sworn to their fathers to give to us, a land flowing with milk and honey. So it was their children whom he raised up in their place that Joshua circumcised. For they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. When the circumcising of the whole nation was finished, they remained in their places in the camp until they were healed. And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the, re the reproach of Egypt from you. And so the name of that place is called Gilgal to this day. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading for this morning reminds us that humility, faithfulness, and vigilance are crucial to our spiritual journey. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will, will, him will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you to be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel is according to St. Mark. It's the fourth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. On that day when evening had come, Jesus said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace! Be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even wind and sea obey him? This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We're going to sing uh, hymn uh, 715.
Well, grace to you and peace in Jesus' name. Amen. We're, like I said, heading into uh, looking at these, these miracles of, of Jesus and uh, seeing how God answers our prayers, answers our needs. So here's a question for you. Have you ever silently thought, does God really care what I'm going through? You ever wonder about things like that? It's not that you don't believe. You believe, but you wonder, does God see what I'm dealing with? Does he care about my struggles? Does he care about those times when, you're, when your heart's breaking? Because you might think if he cared, maybe he'd do something about it. He's God after all, isn't he? If you've ever wondered, does God notice, does God, does God care? You're not alone. Today we're going to look at one of these miracles of Jesus where Jesus' disciples were asking that very question. We're going to be in uh, Mark chapter 4, uh, but it's uh, just a gospel reading that's in your, in your bulletins. Um, a wise pastor I heard once uh, said, uh, you're almost always in one of three places. You're either heading into the storm, you're in the storm, or you're on your way out. You're almost always near the storm right? And that's maybe not the most encouraging news, but it, it is often true. Life can be, it can be challenging, and it can, can seem like the storms are, are always around. Um, sometimes life feels like Florida these days, right? Um, they're getting, said so today the thing hits? Yeah, yeah, we got to pray for those folks, yeah. You know, you, you might think, yeah, I didn't pick this, I didn't choose this, I didn't want this, I didn't expect this. You should know that's exactly where the disciples were in, in Mark chapter 4. They're, they had just had a very, very long, long day of work. And then it says in the Bible, when, when evening had come, Jesus said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat just as he was, and other boats were with him. So it's Jesus' idea to head across to the other side. He wants to go to the other side of the lake. The Bible says, And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care that we're perishing? Apparently not. He was sleeping. He had a rough day. So I want to help you just understand the geography here a little bit. Um, the Sea of Galilee is not so unlike Lake Winnebago. Neither of them are very deep. Both of the deepest points, probably 25, 30 feet. Not real deep. Uh, the Sea of Galilee is 13 miles wide at its widest point, 8 miles long. Um, with Galilee, there are small mountains around it. So if a storm's coming, you can't see it until it's on you. Um, Winnebago is kind of like that. There's some hills and, and trees and things. So um, it, it's, it's a place where storms can just appear to just pop up out of nowhere. And suddenly you're in the, middle, in the middle of them. And because they're so shallow, the waves get big fast. If you've ever been on Lake Winnebago, for example, I don't know, in a 14-foot boat with a 10-horse motor, you learn really quickly you're glad you can swim just in case. Um, I was out there one time, and man, me and a friend of mine, little boat, and all of a sudden, it just came up. And by the by the time we came, you had to turn sideways to get into the kind of the the little dock area where you can take your boat out. And you'd see nothing around you but water, and then you'd see nothing around you but air, and just riding those things. And yeah, but that's where they were, right? In an, after an exhausting day. Jesus said to his disciples, let's go to the other side. You have to notice this. I don't want you to forget. It was Jesus' idea. The disciples would not have been uh, excited about doing this. Um, they were fishermen, but they tended to fish closer to shore. The idea of going out in the middle. Of, of, I mean, you can see across it. It's not like it's you know Lake Michigan or Lake Superior, but... It just wasn't a place that they tended to go. You see, first off, on the other side was where 
those kind of people lived, the, the goyim, they called them, the Gentiles, the outsiders, the, the strangers. Jewish people didn't spend time with the goyim, the Gentiles, because they didn't worship the one true God. They saw them as, as pagans. And truthfully, what they did for worship was pretty, pretty. I wouldn't describe it in polite company because yeah, some of it was, was pretty bad, but it's what they did. Wives' tales at the time also said that, in fact, the devil himself lived where they were going. People at that time were also very superstitious about the, being out in the, in the, the far open water it was something like those those tales of the Bermuda Triangle that used to be so so prevalent, right? The the sea was known to swallow entire boats, gulping down people. It was a common superstition to view the water as the abyss where demons live. The sea was considered the very manifestation of the realm of death. And the disciples are heading right into those two superstitions. They are crossing the abyss where demons live to get to the other side where the devil lives. That was Jesus' plan. After a long, exhausting day. You can bet the disciples would not have been excited about this. But they trust Jesus. So they get in the boat trusting Jesus and next thing they know they're in this massive storm while trusting Jesus and following his plan, which shows us very clearly, even if you're a Christian, you're not exempt from the storms of life. If someone tells you you're going through tough times because you don't believe enough, tell them to talk to the disciples who were walking with him, right? Um, that's just not always true. Even if you're a faithful follower of Jesus, it's no guarantee that you're not going to go through challenges and tough times. In fact, Jesus said, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you'll have tribulation, but take heart. I've overcome the world. So you're going to face storms. You're going to have hard times, difficult times. But Jesus says, take heart. I have overcome the world. So the disciples find themselves in this storm, right? And they're terrified. Some of them are used to the water, but not water like this. They didn't go out in the middle, and not during a storm. And they're desperate. They're scared. They think they're going to die. And they don't want Jesus to die in his sleep. He can die screaming with the rest of them, right? Whatever delusions of control they might have had, though, it was gone. They couldn't control this. Some of you might know what that's like, right? Some problem creeps in, and it's beyond your ability to grasp it or handle it. You may have times when you feel like you're facing something you didn't choose and you didn't expect. You just woke up and you're in the middle of, of the storm you didn't see coming. And then there's our mighty Savior. Jesus, it says, was asleep uh, in the stern on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? They were certain they were going to die. What they were really saying is, you know, we've seen the miracles you do. Don't you care? Because if you care, maybe you'd do something about it. How often have you felt like that, though? When God could have, and we think he should have done what we wanted him to do. God, if you cared, you'd do something about it. If you cared, you wouldn't let this happen. If you cared, you'd show up and help. Don't you care? Sometimes we ask those kinds of questions. You find yourself in the middle of this storm and you wonder, does God even notice what's happening? There's two things to remember in the storm. The first is you're in the storm with his presence he doesn't leave you. He doesn't abandon you. The second thing is you're in the storm for his purpose. You see, you don't have to understand the plan to understand God has a purpose. Remember, this is Jesus' idea to go to the other side. So you have to remember you're in the storm 
with his presence. Every time I read this, I'm reminded of something that happened um, uh, in, in when I was when I was uh, in seventh grade. We were at some of you might recognize at least this. This is at Devil's Lake here in Wisconsin, over closer to, to Madison. Um, we are at Devil's Lake Campground for a church camping picnic. Where else would the church go? But um, I was there with my family, and um, I wonder how many of you are heavy sleepers. Um, my sisters and I were in the tent, and my folks were in the van, and a storm came up. A small tornado, but a small tornado in trees like that causes a lot of ruckus, right? Trees are falling down, and my sisters ran to the van, and and my folks were wondering why I hadn't left the tent, and they assumed he must be too scared to leave the tent. Well, after the storm passed and the trees stopped tipping over, they had to come out to wake me up to see how I was doing. <laughs> I had slept through the whole thing. By the way, I also slept through an earthquake in Tokyo. I never get to see the good stuff. I had, I had slept through the whole thing, and, and the event sticks in my mind, though, because that wasn't the only storm going on. You see, there was uh, the Sheboygan Lutheran High School was just beginning to, was opening up. Um, it's going to open that, that fall. And they were, you know, obviously recruiting students. And some of the parents who were at this church camping event had decided to send their kids to that school. And while sitting around a campfire, I watched my teacher from the previous year, a sixth grade teacher, from a Lutheran school attached to a Lutheran church, ridiculing those parents, some to tears, because they planned to send their kids to that Lutheran high school. A Christian church with a Christian school and a teacher in that school openly mocking people for their faith and their desire to form, support, and encourage the faith of their children. There were storms going on that weekend. For what it's worth, he... Uh, he wasn't teaching there in the fall. For some reason, the pastors of the church had a problem with a Christian day school teacher ridiculing people for their Christian faith. I think he ended up selling refrigerators or something. But, but here's what I really want you to remember. In life, we can get so caught up in the what of the storm that we forget who is in the boat. The who that's in the boat is always more important and more powerful than what is going on around us. The who is always with us. The who is always more important. Jesus is with you through it all. He's never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. You look through all of God's word and you'll see it again and again and again. God has promised his presence. Just a few of them. God said, the Bible says, be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who will go with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And Jesus' very last words before ascending into heaven, Behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Our God is good. He is with you. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. So don't get so caught up in the what of the storm that you forget who is in the boat. Never let the presence of a storm cause you to doubt the presence of God. He is with you. He is always with you. If, if something breaks your heart or taxes your soul, he's still with you. If the job goes away, he's still with you. If you don't understand why something is happening, he is still with you. Our God doesn't leave us. Jesus never said you won't experience storms. He just promised we'd never go through, go through them alone. We learned that last um, the last two weeks, right in in some of these things that we saw. God is right here with us. He laughs with us. He even cries with us. There are always times when we could easily ask the question, why? I think 
it's more important to ask the question, what? Don't ask, what can I do with this? Ask, what is God doing with this for me? Remind yourself to, to lean and to rely on the who, because the who is with you and doesn't leave you. Don't forget who's in the boat. That who is Jesus Christ, our Savior. He is our refuge. He is our strength. He is our helper and our hope. So whatever you're going through, your hurt, your pain, your doubt, when you're tempted to ask why and where are you, don't forget who is in the boat because who is always more powerful than what. So you're in the storm with his presence. But number two, you're in the storm for his purpose. Remember, Jesus was the one who said, let's go across the abyss where demons live to the shore on the other side where the devil lives. The disciples weren't in the storm because they weren't listening to Jesus, because they were outside of his will. They were in the storm because they were right in the middle of God's will for them. Doesn't that raise sometimes some complicated theological questions? Why does Jesus allow his followers to endure the storms. And sometimes we know, and sometimes we don't. We do know God says, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. God is always working all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Why did God allow this? Maybe because there was something they needed to learn in the storm that they couldn't learn on the safety of the shore. While all the disciples are panicking and freaking out in verse 39, it says, Jesus awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. He provided all they needed. He proved to them he had absolute authority over creation, over the wind and the waves. He just showed them he is Emmanuel, walking among us, the God of creation. He didn't just say, please stop. He commanded, peace be still. And I don't know if you've ever been on Winnebago, but the waves don't just stop. They linger for hours, bouncing off the shores. There was calm. The wind died down and there was peace. That's why years later, Peter would write these, these words, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that, so that at the proper time, he may lift you up, cast all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Be sober-minded and watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kind of suffering is being experienced by your brothers and sisters throughout the world. And after you suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Peter writes to him, be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Whatever's burdening you, whatever's making you anxious, whatever's keeping you up at night, whatever's weighing on your soul, Give it to God. Cast your cares on him. Trust him because he loves you more than you can imagine. And he is good. And he is loving. And he is powerful. Never let the presence of the storm cause you to doubt the presence of God. Because you're in the storm with his presence for his purpose. God cares. He cares about every detail and facet of your life. God cares for the brokenhearted. He draws near to those who are desperate. He is close to those who are crushed in spirit. You might be rejected by some. You're never rejected by God. He is always with you. He is always for you. He is always good. Many times in life, you're in one of three places. You're heading into a storm. You're in the middle of the storm. Or you're coming out of the storm. That's because we live in a messed up, broken world. 
And sin is just the storm that life is for us often. But just because you're in the storm doesn't mean you're not in the presence of God because the one who rebuked the storm will one day rebuke every sin-filled storm in this world. By his power and with his grace, he will restore all those who are sick and will heal all those who are hurting and he will bring joy to all those who are mourning. He will end all rejection and he will wipe away every tear. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And he will tell death, I have drawn a line in the sand and you will go no further. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. On that day, Jesus will make all things new. On that day, Jesus will declare, death, don't live here anymore. I cannot encourage you enough to make some time, to take some time, to spend some time with people who encourage and support and care about you and your well-being. You find that here in this church. That's why I tell these folks online often, come on in, stop in and meet these wonderful people because they'll stand with you. The, the Bible says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and to good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of son, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. There is a, an old tradition in the church, to call the church the ark, or the ark of the holy Christian church. It means when you're in church, you're in the ark. The ark is what kept people safe in the storm at the time of Noah. That's what the church is for. That's what the church is about. That's why I want to encourage people to come here, and why I do that so often, because if you're not here, you need this. If you think you don't right now, you can bet the time will come when you will. You need good people around you. And the truth is, these good people here need you here, around them. It's about gathering together, just being with other Christians who maybe some have already been where you're going, as we encourage each other to trust in our God until Jesus comes. Amen. We're going to confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Give grace and courage, O Lord, to your church that we may abide joyfully in the truth of your word and the goodness of your care. Give grace to follow, give us grace to follow your will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give wisdom to those who govern in this and every place that guided by the voice of your word, they may act with integrity and do what is good and wise and benefits those in their care. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. hear our prayer. Give grace and healing to those who are in any need. Deliver them from all adversity and affliction. We pray for uh, Bruce and Kathy, for Dale and Nancy, Jerry, Irvin, Terry, for Pat, Jim, for Bob. We pray for R Ruth and Larry, Travis, Ryan, John, Norma, Georgie, and all those that we know and name in our hearts and our minds. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. That all this we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whom, with whom, and by whom all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Uh, we're going to sing hymn number 785 while I collect the offering.
We're going to turn to page 208. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is indeed good right and our duty and delight to offer you praise and thanksgiving at all times and in all places. Holy Lord, Almighty Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom you have restored us to your family and blessed the homes of your people with your saving love until that day when you shall bring to completion all that you have begun and we shall join with the angels and the archangels and the whole company of heaven evermore praising you and singing. Lord God, Heavenly Father, of your great goodness you made all things, and of your steadfast love you continued to love what you had made, even when we loved you not in return. In the promise laid down through the ages, you pledged us salvation through the ministry of your Son, born in, the, in our likeness, to accomplish our redemption. In his own testament, he established this means of grace by which he would continue to bestow upon us the fruits of his one all efficient sacrifice, death, and triumphant resurrection. So now gathered in his name and at his bidding, we pray that you may make us worthy to receive this blessed holy communion of his body and blood, as we pray as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Savior Jesus Christ.
Now may this eating and this drinking of our Savior's precious body and his blood, may it strengthen you, preserve you, keeping you always in that one true Christian faith that does lead you to eternal life. Then know in peace and know in joy your sins are forgiven you. Amen. We're going to turn to page 211 and sing, Lord, now let your servant depart. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. We pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise that you have rescued your children through your Son and restored your family through forgiveness. Give us grace to both ask forgiveness and to forgive as you have forgiven us, that our earthly families may be rescued from sin, restored to love and unity, and kept strong in Christ all the days of our lives. We would pray all this through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. And then, with believing and and repentant hearts, receive the blessing of our God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Our final hymn is going to be verses 1 and 3 of hymn number uh, 743.
again, uh, good morning. Let's see. Um, well, on Sunday, we celebrated uh, Karen Bowe's retirement. She's, I'm not sure she's settled into this, so she keeps popping in here. <laughs> um, actually, we're just, right, she just did so much stuff that we're sort of learning as we go, but, um, but we sure pray uh, God's blessings on, uh, on her and, and John as they uh, head into their, their new parts of life. Um, of course, we're looking for an uh, uh, office position, uh, probably 10 to 20 hours a week. Um, somebody who's looking, if you know anybody who might be interested in that, um, let, let uh, me or the office know. And then for you folks here, um, they're wondering if you would like to pack bags for Halloween. Um, we hand out... We hand out just bunches and bunches. We open up the church. We have hot chocolate, chairs, and we hand out little bags. There's a little note in there about, you know, if they need a church home, this is a place they can, they can visit. But we're looking for some folks to pack it up. If you've got time uh, next Wednesday, if you feel really excited about doing that, we'd, we'd put you to work for a little while. If you're interested, okay, I see some heads nodding. So, okay, we'll, we'll do that then. Um, let's see, what else? I will... Uh, well, it won't matter to you Wednesday, folks. Actually, I won't be here Sunday. Um, my wife's nephew is getting married, and we'll be in Hinkley, and um, I just won't, I can't get back in time. So uh, Pastor Schwellenberg, the retired guy from Athens, is going to be preaching on Sunday, and then I'm going to have a different message for you on Wednesday. So you can come on Sunday. If you don't like his, come on Wednesday, maybe. Or maybe the other way around. I don't know, however you want to know. Um, uh, Anyway, I just talked to him yesterday, and and uh, he's uh, been kind enough to fill in so that I can uh, head over to uh, Hinkley and uh, be at the, the wedding there. So that's what's going on um, this coming week. Um, I don't know. Besides that, you know, our youth stuff is really taken off. We've got um, 15 or 20 kids in Sunday school. That's kind of kindergarten through through about sixth grade. And we've probably got that many coming from seventh grade through high school to our youth program stuff. So we've got between 30 and 40 kids showing up every Sunday right now. Um, as we get into harvest time, that dwindles a little. And then it's hard getting them back. But we're going we're gonna to work on that. I, this, this whole year, we're just going to, this, this whole school year, we're going to be spending time really working on getting those youth connected to church again. Um, anyway. COVID seems like it was a while back, but we're still feeling its effects. Everybody left, and not everybody came back, right? And the folks who were active, like families with kids, they filled that time with other place, other things, and right. So we gotta have them fill that time with a little bit of here, and and we're doing a lot of stuff to make that happen. But but uh, no, we're we're working on that. Um, let's see. Um, if you're interested in helping out with the hurricanes. But uh, the Missouri Synod's disaster response is already on site and, and doing things there. And um, uh, we will have information, if it's not already there, out under the mailboxes for if you feel moved to, to help out there, to how to give, um, to help them out. Um, I was there when uh, um, Katrina hit. I, was, I, was in, I went to Biloxi. And, um, and it's amazing how the churches are there before anybody shows up. They're, they're like in place and ready to go. They stage that food out of the way of the uh, storm in trucks. And after the storm passes, the trucks start moving. It's that fast. So they're there before anybody. And uh, they do a lot of good. They know the neighborhoods. And, and so, so it's a good thing to support if you're, if you're uh, willing and able. Um, anybody here from Marv? We haven't seen him in a little while. Okay. I'm going to see if I can give him a call. And then I mentioned uh, Wayne. Uh, his wife's been in church, but I haven't seen him. So, okay, I'll I'll call him and see how they're doing. Um, yeah. Other than that, like I mentioned at the beginning, we've got uh, um, we have we have well, we have Betty, right? No, not Betty. Dorothy, you're Betty. You're Dorothy. Yeah. Sorry. We have uh, Dorothy's uh, joining us. Um, her membership stuff just came. We've got two other families for sure. Probably another one. We've got. Um, We've got um, probably five or six in the line um, uh, talking about becoming members. So just just lots of good things are going on, and and uh, it's exciting to see that. I love seeing a church that's that's really alive, 
just getting more life into it and sharing that life with with good folks around us. So so that's what we're going to keep doing. Um, if there's other announcements, as always, I pray God's blessings on your week. Thank you, Pastor. Very good.